So my name is Victor Lidstrom. I'm a PhD at KTH and FY. And my topic is non-coherent underwater communication or acoustic uh, communication. And uh, so I, I'm actually, I, I, I'm gonna try to, in this uh, seminar, I'm going to try to motivate my research field uh, because I, I think for many people, it's not clear like why I am looking at this or like what this, what is it that I'm even <laughs> working with. And then if I have time at the end, I will uh, say some things about uh, the stuff that I have been uh, working with uh, myself. Uh, <clears throat> but basically, I, I don't think I need to motivate uh, why communication is useful uh, and why it is useful in terms of underwater uh, robots. So uh, uh, I'm mostly going to talk about what the difficulties, like introducing the communication problem for the underwater domain. And then I'm going to talk about uh, what the data model is uh, for this uh, domain uh, from a communications uh, standpoint. Uh, and I will uh, show you some examples of the underwater channel and try to introduce the different um, parts of it. And then uh, if I have time, I will uh, say some stuff about permutation frequency shift keying, which is something that I've uh, worked a lot with. Mm. So first, uh, communication underwater. Normally, when you communicate, you have a few different options. You have fiber optics. Uh, you have optical communication, you have radio frequency communication, and in, in our case, acoustic communication. And the reason why uh, we use acoustic communication underwater is because it, basically, if you look at this image, it's the only one where you have a chance to reach like uh, far enough for a practical application, like on the scale of kilometers. Uh, the other one, of course, is fiber optics like there are fiber optic cables going across the Atlantic with very high uh, data rate. But uh, as you can imagine, these are very expensive and often not feasible in situations like uh, when it comes to underwater robots. For example, uh, imagine if Ursa had one uh, cable to each of his swarm robots, they would quickly become entangled. Uh, and yeah, of course, optical, you can imagine if you look through uh, down at the water in the Baltic, you can't see very far. Uh, so that is kind of self-explanatory. And of course, water is a, uh, it's a uh, conductive liquid. So it, it has very strong absorption rates for uh, radio frequency. It has an absorption rate also for acoustic signals, uh, which depends on frequency. So uh, the underwater communication or the, the underwater domain for communication will always be fairly uh, limited in terms of bandwidth because of this uh, limitation in uh, of the absorption over frequency. Uh, a second thing uh, when you go over to acoustic communication is that uh, uh, there is something called uh, multi uh, multipath propagation, which you can see in this picture. So you have one source on the left side and you have one receiver on the right side. So uh, the normal way of transmitting sound on the water is that you transmit in all directions. And so the receiver uh, gets, uh, in the, the best of cases, it gets a signal which has a direct path with no distortion, but then added onto this signal is a multitude of echoes that can bounce one or several times between the sea floor and the, and the surface of the sea, which uh, uh, produces copies of the received signal at the receiver, which, can, which are delayed in time and can be uh, moved in frequency because uh, of, for example, the surface is moving. So the, the different echoes have different uh, Doppler shifts. Uh, yes. Um, so before I start, uh, some uh, important concepts, um, just gonna go over them briefly. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, so normally when you want to uh, convey information using a, a set of signals, uh, you have, you decide on a certain number of signals and let's say you have Q signals and if you have Q signals, then each signal can carry log two of Q bits of information. So you have Q different distinguishable signals and you can map uh, log two Q uh, bits onto each signal uh, that you transmit. And uh, in the case of sinusoids, they can be unique uh, by varying the amplitude or the phase or the frequency. Uh, these are the normal uh, sinusoids are extremely common for communication. And so normally people talk about uh, like amplitude modulation, phase modulation or frequency modulation, which means that you take your bits, you create a number of signals that are different in either amplitude, phase or frequency and you map the bits onto those different signals. So the receiver, the receiver, when it sees the different signals, it decides, okay, I, I see this signal and I decide that these were the bits that uh, were transmitted to me. Uh, the two types that are used normally underwater is you map information to phase and frequency. Uh, I will talk more about this. Uh, and then uh, there is uh, the concept of bandwidth which is, uh, I, I show this in the image here. So if you take a, like a mathematical sinusoid and truncate it to a time window T, normally you define its bandwidth to be one over T, uh, which I show in this uh, picture below here. And so when people, when, when people say that uh, a communication line has high bandwidth, what they mean is that each uh, signal is a very short sinusoid or some other signal. So, so high bandwidth corresponds to shorter signals that carry a, an amount of information. So you get more information at shorter spans of time. Uh, and uh, another uh, important concept is the information rate for a signal. Uh, so if you have Q different signals, uh, and you each signal has time t of transmission, then you get the information rate or the bit rate uh, as log two q times the bandwidth. So, for example, uh, let's say you have a set of signal that conveys one bit per signal, and you have ten kilohertz bandwidth, then you can theoretically uh, get ten uh, kilobit per second. Uh, but uh, you normally don't get this because you have to uh, put in error correction and different uh, things. Uh, yeah, and uh, continuing on the, on the subject of information rate, I show two examples of, of these types of mappings. So on the left, we see frequency shift keying. So there are two frequencies here. Uh, so basically, uh, you, you take a binary value, since I have two different uh, signals, they can convey one bit each. So I map one bit to a symbol, which has uh, two positions. So I have two different distinguishable uh, signals or symbols. And then I map them onto a signal that I transmit over the channel, uh, which in this case is mapped to a signal of uh, a certain frequency. So I would map a binary zero to uh, sending a signal of one frequency and then a binary one to sending a signal of another frequency over a certain amount of time. Uh, if you look at what rate this has uh, per hertz, uh, because bandwidth is a resource that you, you use. Uh, so, so normally you talk uh, in terms of like the efficiency per hertz, uh, which is per hertz. Uh, this type of method has a uh, efficiency or, or a rate per, uh, per hertz of one half. And, and this is, uh, with normal frequency shift keying, this is the highest one you can get, the rate, highest rate you can get with uh, this type of method. Uh, in in, on the other hand, if you use phase shift keying, 
uh, you have in this in this picture I have four different phases uh, for a signal that is of the same time length as the other example. So in this case, I have four distinguishable signals, the four different phases. And so they each signal conveys uh, two bits of information. Uh, and uh, the rate or the efficiency is higher for this type of method. So in general, you can think of frequency shift keying as a slower method compared to phase shift keying because uh, in phase shift keying, you can, you can increase the rate by putting more phases into the signal or signals with more phase shifts. Uh, but of course, they are then more uh, uh, closer to each other uh, and are uh, more susceptible to, uh, to noise. Uh, but these are, are the two like common ways to, to uh, communicate or to map information to signals that are transmitted. Um, so here I'm showing a, a general system view of the communication problem. Uh, so normally you start with some application that wants to send some bits, some information uh, status of the platform or something like that, for example. Uh, you add, normally you add redundancy. So you map these to a code and you get a, a number of code bits. Uh, and so here you have more bits than you had originally. Some of them are for redundancy. And then you map these bits to signals that to, to a set of signals that you transmit over time. So the total signal is this X over T here. And this is the, the actual signal that is going through the channel. Um, and uh, in this uh, image here, I'm showing uh, there's two views. There's the passband view and the complex baseband view. Basically, you have to pick a frequency range where you transmit the signals but you can, uh, you can condense this problem to a complex baseband problem. So you, you, you take a signal which is normally in complex baseband. It's a complex signal with a frequency content between uh, negative half the bandwidth and positive half the bandwidth. And you move it to a frequency range. You transmit it through a transmission filter. Uh, it goes through the channel. Uh, you get some noise on top of it. You receive it and you move it down to complex baseband. And this is summed up by this uh, complex baseband model where uh, all these different parts are essentially baked into this term here, which is a complex uh, channel for, uh, for your uh, complex uh, signal that, that you transmit. Uh, and uh, this, this, so this is how you write out uh, the, um, model normally for the underwater uh, communication problem. So you have a signal that contains a set of symbols with your bits. And this has been converted to a, a long uh, signal, uh, time continuous signal of concatenated uh, sinusoids, for example. And this, because of the multipath structure of the channel, you, you receive a, a, uh, an output which is the convolution between an impulse response of the channel. Uh, for example, you can you can see that you have uh, you have uh, like one one contribution from the direct path, and then you have a replica that comes uh, at a certain delay tau afterwards of this uh, signal that you transmitted. Uh, and uh, of course, this. Um, this uh, W term is the background noise, which you can, uh, you often assume that it's complex Gaussian because of, uh, for different reasons, for example, the central limit theorem of, uh, of noise so sources with different uh, distributions. So the problem with underwater acoustic communication is that this channel uh, term, this impulse response, it is varying with the time t. And how quickly this one varies with time t is what makes it difficult to communicate on the water. Because you can estimate the channel. So normally, if you have a, a, a channel that is not changing over time, you can measure up this uh, 
channel term. And then you make an inverse filter of it and apply it to R and you get back your uh, transmitted signal without, no, without any problems. If the impulse response is changing over time, that means that you would need to re repeat this process of measuring the channel term to invert the output so you get back your original signal. You would need to repeat this with however, like how often you would need to repeat this would depend on how stationary the channel is. And uh, I'm going to show you some examples on why this is problematic for the underwater domain. Uh, so first I, I'm showing you a, uh, so the, the, I have three different channels uh, that I want to show you that comes from a paper. Uh, it's in the reference. Uh, so here there are, I know that there's a lot of different plots here, but if we look at the main two black pictures here, these are the most important. So here you can see this term H and on the x-axis, you see the impulse response over delay. And then you can see how this impulse response is changing over time. So, so basically, at delay 0, you have a main tap in this impulse response and nothing else afterwards. So this is basically a channel where you get more or less uh, your signal back with, with some uh, Gaussian noise. And over time, it stays the same. It doesn't change. Uh, if, if you take the Fourier transform of this uh, picture here uh, over the y-axis, you get something called the, the spreading function, which it's the same. It's the same. Uh, it, it captures a different aspect of the same picture. It conveys, uh, for example, if, on, if you look at this main tap here, it conveys how much Doppler shifted that signal is uh, due to the contribution of this uh, tap in the channel impulse response. So you, you can see this as a, like a small dot, which means that you basically, you get one version of your signal back, you can see it from this image, and you get it without any Doppler shifts, and you get it without any like uh, uh, copies that are Doppler shifted. So it's a nice single uh, dot here. Basically, the, these other pictures down here are, uh, this picture is if you sum this picture over the y-axis, and this picture if you sum this picture over the x-axis. So this is called the power delay profile. It shows this main tap and this subsequent taps, but it merges uh, the channel over time. And then this one merges it over delay. So you, you get the, the frequency shifts. Uh, uh, and, and yes, this one is important uh, for the discussion. Uh, this is the phase of the main tap. So the phase shift you get from on your signal from uh, the contribution of the main, the main tap. And this phase shift is very small and it doesn't change much over time. So basically you could measure this phase shift in the beginning before you transmit any information. And then you could basically assume that it, it is more or less constant over your whole transmission time if you transmit over 30 seconds because it doesn't really change. Uh, this is, of course, the best type of channel you can get. So this is not what you normally get. Uh, and this is more, this is another example of how it can look. So uh, again, you see that there are many taps here of similar uh, contribution in terms of energy. So you basically get your signal back with uh, a few different delays and they are uh, they, they have similar energy. And if you look at the frequency, they are the, the different taps have a different uh, they have the different taps have different Doppler shifts. Uh, you can see a, a type of Something happened here. Anyway, uh, so the point here is that if if you would if you would use phase shift keying for this type of channel, uh, the phase shift that you see on your signal would 
depend on all these phase shifts of the different taps that influence on your signal. So you would need to track all of these. Uh, you would need to follow the channel at, uh, at the same rate as the tap that is changing the fastest, basically. Uh, so that's this is a reason why uh, the face of the people say that the face of the channel changes quite quickly. And uh, yeah, this one is just for uh, for fun. Basically, this is a channel that is called an overspread channel. So you have you can't you can't almost even see the, the, the channel because everything is so so mixed. It's like a perfect. Uh, uh, perfect mix of different uh, echoes. You can only see that there's some some energy in this band, but uh, you, you can't even see it. So th this is a ch type of channel that normal people would say is impossible. Yes, OK, I, I see that I'm I'm about to run out of time, so I'll try to speed up here. So for the non-coherent, uh, for non-coherent communication, uh, I go back to this uh, data model. And my signals. I construct. Excuse me. Okay. Yes. Uh, so the signals are constructed uh, by mapping a set of amplitudes, which is contained in this S, to a set of of sinusoids of different frequencies. So. Uh, the, the total signal that you transmit is the sum of all the different sinusoids, which have one amplitude each that you define in this S here. And the point is that if you if you look at this channel in in the frequency domain, so if you take the Fourier transform of, of 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 the impulse response, if it changes slowly over the duration of the signal that you transmit, you could basically view this as a a phase shift and an amplitude uh, scaling of S. So th this is what is shown in this uh, A here. You, you have the signals that you transmit, and then you have a scaling from the the, the abs value of, of the Fourier transform at that frequency, and you have a phase shift uh, on this, the, the phase shift on this band. So then you can rewrite this channel model as, as this type of channel. And this is a linear problem. And uh, for uh, if you go to uh, estimation theory, since it's a linear problem, it has a linear estimator, which is shown here. And most maybe most of you have not seen this type of estimator, but you would probably recognize it if in the special case that the different sinusoids in E here are harmonic, because then, then uh, the elements uh, of A here are estimated by the Fourier transform of R uh, and uh, the Fourier transform uh, with the different uh, frequencies. So let's say that you would know uh, the absolute value of, of the channel of the different frequencies. Uh, then you could, in theory, get back the symbols that you transmit because you, you do this estimation and then you divide by the scaling uh, of the channel at that frequency. And here, since we're taking the absolute value of the channel, we basically average out the phase shifts. So we don't care about the phase shifts that are imposed by the channel. So normally you would need to know the absolute value of of the the scaling of the channel times uh, an amplitude that you would send, and you would need to know this for all the different frequencies that you are using, and you you estimate this quantity by sending a certain amount of known symbols. You estimate the amplitudes at the different frequencies, and then when information is coming, you compare the amplitudes that you are seeing on the data to the amplitudes that you expect on each frequency band, basically. And you don't require the phase uh, to do this because you're averaging it out by doing this absolute uh, operation. Uh, so the, the real killer here uh, is 
uh, is how fast do these quantities, quantities change? So I think I've kind of motivated why the phase shift can change quite rapidly by showing you some examples of how the channel can look. Uh, in general, the, uh, the, the, the amplitude scaling changes much more slowly, but this is something that is not, I, I haven't seen anyone really publish how, how fast this quantity changes. Uh, but I can give you an example for, from a, um, a paper that we wrote. And uh, so th this is basically two examples of, of uh, two measurements where uh, the sea was either very calm or very like uh, windy and uh, moving a lot. Uh, so we made a type of statistical uh, construction on, on the question, like what is the, the, the probability that it, it has that uh, the amplitude hasn't changed by a certain amount uh, over a certain time. So, so you can see even in the case when it was quite windy, so you would have a, a very problematic channel. We could we could have it uh, uh, quite stationary for a, a few hundreds of milliseconds, uh, which it, it, when it comes to the phase, it can change much more quickly than this. But of course, this is something that. Uh, I think we need to look more into. Um, but this is the reason why uh, non-coherent communication is of interest, even though it is slower than, for example, phase uh, or phase uh, shift king, which is a coherent method. It's because you make it much more robust to the non-stationarity of the channel. And in general, you don't know how non-stationary it is before you go out. So it, you are less sensitive to not knowing how the channel looks when you go out to do some communication on the water. And uh, yes, uh, my time is up. So I, I, I think I will actually end here uh, before going into another part. So uh, thank you for listening. And uh, please, if you have some questions, I know some people need to go. Uh, so. so.